welcome to Cover Story. Today we are joined by Gurcharan Das. He's an author, he's an economist, he's the former CEO of Procter & Gamble. But today we are talking to you, I think, in your role as an author, as a philosopher, someone who just come out with his third book in a trilogy. I think India Unbound was the first one, which was more about material life. The next was Difficulty of Being, which was more, I think, on dharma and spiritual life. And now, of course, we have Kama, the riddle of desire. This is on, uh, well, on desire and Kama. But I will let you tell us w uh, what this book is all about. Well, let me just say that, you know, the whole process mm. for me begins with the ordinary human need to be happy. We all want to be happy. Mm. And I've always believed in a one-line definition Did of you? happiness, which is to love the work you do and love the person you live with. Now, the unfortunate thing is, one, of course, very few people achieve both. Mm. But second, nobody teaches us. In other words, we go to school, but nobody tells us how do we love our work. Nobody teaches us how to love the person we live with. Mm. And yet, these are the most important things in our life. Now, as I've grown older, I've also realized that the classical Indian definition mm. of happiness ha makes a lot of sense. And that is the notion of the purusharthas, the goals of life, which is to say, as you know, you began, mm. that ha happiness or a happy, flourishing life consists of material well-being, which is called artha. Okay. And that's where I wrote my first book, India Unbound, which was about material well-being. Mm. In other words, you can't be happy if you are worried about your next meal. The second idea is moral well-being, mm. dharma. And that was my book, The Difficulty of Being Good, mm. which is uh, really about right and wrong, and sleeping well at night, mm. doing the right thing. And I interrogated the Mahabharat to, to get to the root of the, the, right. the idea. And so the third book the th is the third in the Purusharthas, the third goal of life is Kama. Mm. Kama, uh, and which is what this book is about. Now, we normally deny Kama. Oh, Kama, Krodha, Loba, you know, all these bad things. And yet, what I show is the wisdom of our ancients who showed us that this is one of the goals of life. Meaning that karma means desire mm. and pleasure. And not to deny it, but to embrace it, to live a happy, flourishing life. The fourth goal, of course, is moksha, which is spiritual well-being. And that book I have not written. That is the next in line, <laughs> is it? But you know, uh, desire, I, I like the title, The Riddle of Desire, because we usually see desire painted, the devil is a so, so yes. desire. It's always said to be a weakness, you're giving. But here you're saying, no, it's a good thing to give in to desire. Yes, or, and I'm going really back to the root of the, the, the ancient civilization of our country, yeah. where even in the Rig Veda, uh, you know, un, in, in, in in the, in the Bible, in the Christian tradition, uh -huh. what the Westerners believe is that the beginning was light mm. because God said, let there be light. Mm. In the classical Indian way, in the beginning was desire. And the Rig Veda says uh -huh. that the cosmos was created from the seed of desire in the mind of the one. And so it's the source of creation. Not only is the source of creation, they realized, it's the source of all action. Mm. You wouldn't wake up in the morning, Priya, if you didn't feel desire. Mm. And it's the source of procreation, of having babies. Mm. And so the elev Indian civilization is unique because it elevated desire to a goal of life. And not only that, they actually created a god mm. named Kama after this goal of life. And the god Kama, much like the Greek god, yeah. um, he shoots arrows 
at his victims. Mm. So, and instead of arrows, this guy, Kama, mm. shoots flowers. So that's how the cover of oh, this book is... Oh, that is interesting, yeah. Is, uh, uh, so I'll, I'll just sh show it. So this is when the two people meet. Mm. So when they first meet, mm. it's the white lotus, which Kama shoots at both of them. Mm. And they feel first time the desire. This is the flower of the Ashoka tree. Mm. And this is when they decide to do something about it. Yeah, red is the color of passion. <laughs> and then this is the white jasmine when there's intimacy. So there's intimacy, there's marriage often, there's children. Mm. And then the hard work of raising the children, <laughs> climbing ladders, and poor desire wanes in the fourth stage of life, which is the fourth uh, flower. And this is the tough part, mm. because unless you cultivate desire right through your life, desire will die. This is the sand fifth stage, which is the sandalwood flower. So this, the riddle of desire mm. that I talk about is really uh, the conflict between this moment when you are here mm. and, and how do you cope with that particular moment. And in fact, that's why I feel in India, karma is that we should not call, I mean, Valentine's Day should mm. be changed to Kama Deva Divas. <laughs> you know, we should celebrate it. And yeah. so the riddle of desire, mm. Priya, is what and I'll, and I'll illustrate it with, ah. a, with a story. Mm. And it's the story of, in the book mm. where the narrator, Amar, is mm. his name. And so he's reached the fourth stage. He loves his wife, but desire has waned. And one day he finds himself traveling to, he lives in Bombay, mm. and he's traveling to Pune ah. on the Deccan Queen. You know, that's how we used to go mm. from Bombay to Pune. We still go from Bombay to Pune, from VT. And uh, he sees a beautiful woman on the train. And they're seated close by. And so they start, like polite passengers, they start chatting with each other. Oh. <clears throat> and first the conversation is impersonal about the weather and all that. But slowly there's obviously some chemistry between them. Mm -hmm. They, uh, the conversation becomes more intimate and they talk exchange about their families, etc. And eventually they, there is, there is like electricity mm -hmm. and they have connected and as, and they, and they part at mm -hmm. the Pune station. She, she's a professor of film She's going to give a lecture at the Film Institute. Mm. And he's gone for work uh, in Pune. And, uh, but it's clear to both of them that they might have an affair. Mm. And so he thinks in his mind, he's, he's horrified at the thought because he loves his wife, he loves his children. And he says, if, I, if we do have an affair, mm what will be the consequence? I'll hurt the person I love the most, right. my wife, and I'll also hurt my children. Mm. But then he says, well, the children are growing up yeah. and they'll go away. Mm. So that's not something that should be the main con criterion. Of course, he has to remember that, he has, that if, the, if he forgets them, they're not going to, f <laughs> they're going to remind him for the rest of his life. Mm. But then he says, well, um, we could keep the affair a secret so nobody would know. Mm. My wife won't know. Her husband would not know. And so we could live. And nobody would be hurt. And huh? nobody would be hurt. Mm. But then he says, thinks back and says, but what would that mean? It would mean that I would have to lie. Lies would have to be piled upon lies. Mm. And do I want to live that kind of life 
which is, becomes an inauthentic life where I can't tell the difference mm. between a truth and a lie. And no. And then he says, in a, res in a resigned kind of way, well, maybe it's not a good idea to have an affair. And so he goes about his work, and she goes about her work. And then he re when he's back to Bombay, he finds he misses her. Mm. And she doesn't, I mean, it, the, it was just not a passing kind of thing. It's weighing on his mind. Mm. And he says that, you know, <clears throat> what will be the consequence of not having an affair? The consequence might be that I might end up as a shriveled, old, dried up man mm. resenting my wife, my children, for, and myself for not having taken advantage of the one opportunity in my life for a certain thrilling kind of happiness. Mm. And so he, uh, I, I, I won't tell you what he does, because no. you've got to, you know, the, the the, you've got to solve that riddle. <laughs> but his thinking mm. that he goes through, yeah. and, his, and also the other woman, mm. the thinking she goes through, uh, is the classic riddle of desire. There are now many riddles of desire mm. in this book. But this is a conflict between dharma. Yeah, I was just saying the difficulty of being comes here also. Correct. Yeah. In other words, uh, Priya, it's the conflict between duty. Dharma is a duty to another. Okay. And karma, he realizes, which we all are very scared of and opposed to, mm -hmm. and we deny, is actually a duty to yourself. That's a very interesting way of putting it. And so, I mean, this is why our ancients elevated karma to a goal of life. And so, we have to recognize in our life mm. that these are real dilemmas and not just be to be swept away. Galat hai. Ye sab kuch galat hai. We have to realize we pay a price every time. What he's showing us is that if he did not have an affair, there was also a price to be paid. Yeah. Price to his psyche, to his well-being. And there may never be an answer, mm. but at least we must be aware that there are, there's a price to be paid. And so, you know, he's very sad mm. at this realization. And he almost asks himself, you know, why can't love be a romantic love, mm. be like a game of tennis. You know, in the sense that it's you, you work all day and in the evening from five to seven, mm. you go and play a game of tennis. In fact, French have a very, uh, in, uh, French, in the old French mm. had the institution or called cinq à sept, which means five to seven. Oh. Five to seven is when liberated couples mm they both gave each other freedom mm. to have an affair and they each they found a place obviously and with and they never asked each other mm. who and where did you spend from five to seven mm. but after seven o'clock you came home you were with your family with your children in weekends you never engaged in five to seven mm. but it was considered almost like a game of tennis where you uh, did not raise it to this thing, uh, to, to sort of a this kind of moral wrongness, yeah. but more the idea that this is part of human, human life. And if both people are okay mm. with it, then what is wrong? You're not, you're not uh, being dishonest with each other, you don't have to lie to each other, but you confine it. Mm. You don't let it spill out over the weekend, you don't let it spill out to your dinner time with the children. But then again, rules are coming in, so can desire have rules, whether it's a five to seven rule or a, you know, no... Well, it's, it's of course, uh, there are rules we live by, mm. but it's better, as in a democracy, that we create these rules ourselves. 
rather than be created either by God, mm -hmm. Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. thou shalt not commit adultery. It's much better that these rules are consensual, there's consent. Mm -hmm. We have a parliament or we have a conversation <coughs> between a couple mm -hmm. of, of and what you kind said of in your beginning, in the beginning, that India was more open, you know, exactly. than the Rig Veda, as you quoted. In exactly. Fact. Yeah. That our civilization actually, in fact, in the Mahabharat, there's mm. a wonderful story uh, where I think uh, Yudhishthir asks Bhishma, Bhishma mm. he says, Who gets more pleasure, a man of pleasure from sex, mm. a man or a woman? Oh. And Bhishma says, well, you know, you have to be a man and a woman mm. to answer that question. Mm. And so he says, hang on, yes, there yeah. was a king yeah. called Bhangashwana. Mm. And Bhangashwana had been for the first half of his life <coughs> a king, mm. a man, mm. who ruled a, a kingdom. Oh. And then in the middle of his life, he had a transgender change, obviously and he became a woman and then at the because he was a good person he's told at the end of his life now you have a choice mm. for your next life would you rather be born as a woman or a man and he says a woman and people say you crazy mm. as a man you could be an emperor yeah. i mean you could be a powerful figure and you want to be a woman mm. And he says, yes, you know why? Because one, a woman enjoys sex more than a man. Yes. And second, the emotional life is more important and it's richer than the public life. Mm. So no king or no prime minister mm. or Mr. Modi or Mr. Manmohan Singh, mm. nobody has as much pleasure as two people in love. And what he says is, and this is why actually E.M. Foster mm. wrote a novel, I mean wrote this book, you know yeah. he wrote a passage to, to India, India yeah. and then he wrote a book called Two Cheers for Democracy. Mm. And people said, why two cheers? Why not three cheers? And Foster says, I reserve three cheers only for the private life. So democracy is all about your public life. And so in the private life, when two human beings connect, mm. that is a far richer experience than the lives of prime ministers and kings. And kings. <laughs> On that note, we're going to take a break, but we're going to come back and talk about this third life, the th rather the emotional life rather than the economic life or the public life. And I suspect there would be a link, but after a break. Welcome back to Cover Story. We are in conversation with Gurcharan Das about his new book, Kama, the Riddle of Desire. Uh, before the break, you, uh, you, know, you touched upon a very interesting topic about the emotional life. But is there a connection between the, I mean, there is obviously a connection between the emotional life, the private life and the public life. Yes, yes. Well, there is. I think uh, for a healthy society, mm. you know, just as we want a healthy society to be economically prosperous, mm. And we want the rule of law in the public domain. domain. Uh, we want accountability of our rulers to the people through the ballot box or somewhere. So I think, uh, Priya, that we want in our public life mm -hmm. a kind of grounding of the citizen. That is, a citizen is not complete. And this is where the ancient idea of the goals of life comes in. Mm. That to be a complete human being, you need to have a, um, a successful material, moral, uh, emotional and a spiritual life. So I think that uh, 
we should pay attention. And I'm so glad that last year mm. was a very big event. Okay. I've pers okay. Well, I mean, I almost think of it that if you think of the milestones of Indian history, mm. the milestones are 1947, yes. when we got our political independence, 1991, when oh. we got our economic independence, 2018 is a milestone like that because in 2018 you had a number of events mm -hmm. that took place in our country and most of them we don't even realize what happened. You, you had first of all um, triple talaq. Mm. Triple talaq liberated 15% um, of the women of our country who could get, I mean, they, they, they freed them mm. from the anxiety mm. of a husband who could pick up the cell phone and uh, by Me Too, I mean, by uh, just straight WhatsApp, mm. send her a message that I'm leaving you. Yeah. The second thing in happened 2018 was we decriminalized homosexuality. Yes, that was a big so one. So another about 15% of the population mm. got liberated uh, through decriminalizing homosexuality. Then we had decriminalizing of adultery. Mm. Now this was again a colonial law, mm. not part of our heritage, a law that had been brought to India by the colonial rulers. Uh, reflecting their obsessions mm. of, in the Victorian times, yeah. which criminalized relations between men and women, and the entry of women into mm. temples, the Sabri Mala. Yeah. Now, whether you agree with or not with the actual uh, particular case, but it was a step forward for for women, mm. which is half liberating half your women oh, yeah. and then half the population in mm. other words and finally the me too movement you know it's interesting that mm. the me too, you know we, this is a time we live in history mm. when globalization is under threat yeah but here was an idea almost about a year and a half ago which started in america and if you see the me too map of the world today it's covered that almost 100 countries mm. felt the effect of the Me Too movement, including India. Yeah. And, and this also was a liberation for the emotional life, mm. that men could not exploit mm. uh, women in that easy way, and women were free to get up. So I rather think that 2018 was an important milestone mm in now how we institutionalize it, mm. how this battle mm. for women's uh, freedom continues is yet to be seen. But clearly for me 2018 was a watershed in the public, public life of the country. Before we wind up, just a little bit about yourself, you know, uh, someone who uh, grounding economics, corporate background, how did you turn towards philosophy and writing books such as this? Well, you know, I, I, my degree hmm. at Harvard was in philosophy. I didn't know that. Yes, most people don't. Hmm. And I was, I came into business by accident. I was going to do a PhD in philosophy hmm. after Harvard at Oxford. Hmm. And at the last minute, I chickened out. And uh, I was in Chandigarh at mm. the home of my parents. And I was to go to Oxford in, the, in, in September. And suddenly I asked myself, do I want to spend the rest of my life at that stratosphere of abstract thought? Mm. And so I got scared. And so I wrote to Oxford, said, look, can you delay this? Yeah. Uh, and they were very, uh, they agreed and so on. And in the meantime, my parents found an unemployed son mm -hmm. who had a degree from Harvard 
uh, a Phi Beta Kappa degree mm -hmm. from Harvard who was doing nothing. And my mother's neighbor would particularly needle her mm. and say to her, and what is your son doing? I know. <laughs> Mundaki kar ah. And my mother would get very embarrassed. Every day, you know, she would ask her. So to relieve my mother of some of the pain, mm. I applied for a job uh, which they advertised in the paper for a management trainee. Mm. Those days, you didn't have to have an MBA to get a job. Mm. So it was a company that made Vicks VapoRub. And I joined that company. And uh, of course, I was like, but like the man who came to dinner, mm. I stayed on and enjoyed the rough and tumble of the business life. And Later, moved my, to the head of the table also. <laughs> <laughs> yes, my company sent me before I made, became the head of the company, they sent me to Harvard Business School mm. to learn a little bit of business. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I did a, I did a two month, I mean I did two, over two summers, mm. right. like a mini MBA, ah. a, um, what is called an advanced management program. And so I went into business. But you know, Unlike uh, the normal corporate executive, mm. uh, I would spend my weekends reading and writing, unlike my corporate friends who played golf. I was just going to say that, yes. <laughs> and so I began uh, seriously. Mm. Um, I wrote a play in my 20s, I wrote three plays in my 20s, mm. um, and that was lucky. The plays did well, they got performed, they got published. One got performed uh, in Edinburgh at the festival, another was performed off-Broadway in New York. And so I tasted a fair amount of success in my weekend career. That's what you've been weekend career. lucky in both your weekend job and your nine to five in job. The, in the thirties, I wrote a novel mm. called A Fine Family, which is yeah. still selling. In fact, that over there is the cover of mm. the novel mm. of the uh, fine family. So I, uh, that weekend writer mm. became a full-time writer when I reached the age of 50 because I realized that I really loved writing very much. I had tasted success in it and uh, why not? Follow your karma <laughs> as you would Follow say. Follow my karma. Right? Thank you so much for talking to us. It's been a pleasure hearing you. Thank you. And we wish you all the best with your book. But that's it for now. Thank you for watching this show. We'll see you again same time next week.